Good day. I'm Jim Winship for Diplomatic Connections magazine. We're visiting the Turkish ambassador's residence today, and we're delighted to have as our guest uh, Ambassador Namik Tan, uh, Ambassador of Turkey to the United States. Um, two years now, yes. February, early 2010 was Absolutely. the beginning of your, yes. of your term. Yes. Well, we're delighted to be here and uh, for you to share your home with us. It's quite remarkable. Can you tell us just a little bit about the history of the house? Thank you so very much. I appreciate uh, uh, this uh, discussion. I think um, I should first of all um, uh, express to you how much I'm pleased to host you in this residence. This residence is a historical one. I think it's uh, probably the most uh, impressive residences that we have in this town. Um, actually, um, in, uh, the original owner of this house was an oil uh, uh, business uh, person uh, who had oil wells in the south and he was uh, so wealthy uh, that wealth brings some more wealth as you, as you imagine and uh, he invented uh, the uh, bottle uh, uh, metal bottle caps of the uh, Soda, uh, ah, soda. The, the crown caps that go on the bottom. That's bottles, right. Yeah. In uh, late uh, uh, 1800s, mm -hmm. 1888, I think. And then uh, he decided to enjoy his wealth. And he uh, started traveling. And one day, and also uh, developed some interest in philanthropic work and uh, Oriental culture, and while he was traveling uh, to our region, he ended up in Istanbul. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, in the later days of the Ottoman Empire, when Ottoman Empire was uh, falling apart, uh, but he fell in love with Istanbul, and he met with another American there. They became friends. An architect. That architect was a talented one. Actually, he built. Uh, the first uh, uh, U.S. Uh, representation, which was the U.S. Consul General in uh, Istanbul, uh -huh. uh, and they became friends. And he asked him to uh, to build a house for him in Washington. So and there was agreed. Turkish influence in the house from the very uh, beginning, absolutely. even that, before it was that's, the embassy. That's the point. Actually, <laughs> this the history uh, has a lot of uh, relevance to American history. Uh, Turkish history and Turkish-American uh, relationship. Uh, actually, then uh, in 1910, this gentleman uh, started building this house, and it ended in 1915. And uh, the owner, uh, original owner, uh, stayed here for about 13 years until 1928. And in 1928, uh, he passed away. But before his passing away. He uh, calls all his family members around and he makes a will. Ah. He says, uh, if uh, in the future, after my passing, uh, you happen to sell this house, you should go to Turks and give them the right of first refusal. And uh -huh. that was the, the case in 1930s after his uh, uh, passing. Uh, his elder daughter comes to the church, Turkish embassy, and she tells about the story and she offers the house and uh, I think there was wisdom then although Great Depression uh, mm -hmm. was hitting in the whole world uh, Turkish uh, government decided to buy this house for $260,000 everything included, every single item you see here in this house 65% uh, of it is uh, original so I think uh, since then it is our embassy uh, residence, and uh, for a while, until 1990, it was also um, uh, a, a chancery as well. But in 1990, we moved out uh, the, uh, the uh, chancery section mm -hmm. uh, to another, uh, a few blocks away. You know, it's an architecturally <coughs> yes. remarkable building further up Massachusetts Avenue. That's right. But uh, the first, uh, the first ambassador was uh, uh, the elder un uh, uncle of uh, Muhtar Kent, the present CEO of Coca-Cola. Ah, yes, and he served here for a while, and then came uh, Mehmet uh, Münir Ertegün, 
the second ambassador. He was our ambassador in Paris, and he was posted uh, immediately afterwards to uh, Washington. And he stayed here for 10 years. Actually, during this time, he had two sons and one daughter. The two sons were, one of them was Ahmed Ertegun. Uh, you would know his name uh, from Atlantic Records. Uh -huh. uh, they were, yes. the, the two sons were teenagers then. They were young and energetic, and they were just hanging around uh, on the streets of Washington uh, during the segregation time. It was very, very hard living in this town uh, for not on, uh, monk, uh, for the foreigners, but for the black African American of people. Of course. And he, uh, they, they developed some friendships, and they became friends with many, um, uh, you know, well-known. Uh, uh, I think iconic figures like uh, Duke Ellington, Sammy Davis Jr., uh, Ray Charles. Uh, so, so that explains the, the link between the Turkish Embassy and the jazz concerts that you sponsored that's, that's as well. That's knows about that. <laughs> and actually, uh, he uh, and they, um, uh, they started inviting them to this house mm -hmm. in different places, uh, in different rooms in this house. Uh, uh, they were just uh, uh, having some uh, jazz sessions uh, together with their friends, uh, who were nobody then, no, no one knew them. Uh, but uh, later on, uh, uh, they became, of course, uh, so much famous, and uh, uh, they gave a lot of support to Ahmed Atigun mm -hmm. and his uh, music company rec records uh, uh, of uh, uh, their own were always uh, released through that company, and uh, Amin Ertegun became, uh, 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 I think, a celebrity here in this country. And what, what, uh, what's more, actually, one day, after this place became uh, a jazz center, uh, a, a southern senator writes a letter to our uh, then ambassador, uh, Mehmet Ertegun, says, uh, Ambassador, I pass by your embassy every day, every morning, and I see so many black people in front of your front door, you know, coming in and out. Uh, is this true, what I see? Actually, uh, those people uh, should not be uh, uh, treated like that, you know. Um, so, uh, uh, can you explain to me uh, what's going on uh, mm -hmm. in your embassy? And our ambas ambassador writes back uh, 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 courageously, he says, uh, Mr. Senator, yes, it's true. Uh, I mean, what you, s you have seen <coughs> is the absolute truth. Actually, uh, in our tradition, we always host our friends to our front door. So those people are our friends. However, we're delighted and honored, most honored, uh, if you come and visit our embassy. Uh, uh, but we, uh, we would post you through our back door, he says. So, <laughs> yeah. so it's a sense of irony there. Yes, as, that's as well. right. So uh, this uh, ambassador, um, of course, uh, dies uh, uh, on duty. Yeah. And uh, it was the start of Cold War years. Mm -hmm. And Turkey uh, then was a very new republic, and uh, uh, which was threatened by the Soviet bloc and especially by the then Soviet Union, and, uh, and, uh, and, we, and we should say Turkey's geographic location astride the Mediterranean, the Black Sea, and so forth, absolutely. makes it a, a critical crossroads. Very Even true. before there was a communist party in Russia, there was still conflict absolutely. over control of the Bosporus and the Dardanelles. Absolutely, that's, that's, the, that's the point. And of course, the United States, uh, wanted to make a gesture, uh, actually, uh, and sent his remains to Turkey uh, by this uh, famous uh, aircraft carrier, Missouri. Uh -huh. And that uh, created a lot of sympathy over the U.S. And then... Famous because that's where the Japanese surrender was signed yes, yes, with yes, MacArthur yes. and the, the emperor and so forth. And then uh, Turkey and the U.S. started coming closer and closer every day, and Turkey uh, finally ended up uh, in being a NATO member. Yes. 60 years ago, exactly 60 years ago, 1952, but before that, of course, we fought shoulder to shoulder uh, in Korea, 
And so uh, that is, uh, so everything started in this, in this house. I mean, this history is, uh, uh, I think, uh, a sort of a, um, a great relevance to, to, to our country's uh, history. It's fascinating that it's, that it's linked not only to Turkish-American relations, but linked to the, the history of jazz and, and the development of rock and roll and musicians here. And so it's linked not just to the United States, but really linked to the, the Washington community beyond the federal government entirely. Absolutely. And no one knows about this. And I'm thankful to you in uh, giving me the opportunity to explain this uh, to uh, the public audiences. Actually, uh, uh, most people, when we started the Ahmed Atigun Jazz Series here last year, we did six uh, different events. Yes. And this year, we'll continue, uh, we are continuing it. And on the 8th of May, we have another session. I think you should come and be our guest and uh, try to cover it. Nothing would make me happier. Yeah, you, 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 I'll make sure that you... I don't know, I'm a long-time jazz fan, so I, I would love to be here. So, uh, then, of course, uh, uh, when we started this whole uh, series, people uh, asked us, you know, what is it to do uh, uh, with Turkey and jazz? Exactly. And so that is, that's the point. So, um, uh, we are proud and that we have kept uh, this embassy intact. Uh, it's not easy, as you can imagine, to maintain such a, a house which is uh, uh, more than a, a museum, more than a residence. Yes, yes, yes. Well, the, these rooms are absolutely beautiful. I hope the residence part of the building is, is comfortable for you as well. Sometimes well, it's, it's hard to live in a museum. <laughs> well, it has, uh, I think, uh, Five uh, stories, and uh, the middle one, which we are in, is uh, for uh, you know just hosting our uh, guests. Yes. And, uh, uh, the rest is for uh, residential purposes. Now, this is not your first tour of duty here in Washington, yeah. is it? Can you tell us a little bit about your career? We're always interested in the development of our guests' careers over time. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, during my school times. Uh, my father was a governor, actually, uh -huh. and uh, he had a lot of interest in, uh, in diplomacy, and uh, he wanted me, uh, always, he, he wanted me to be a diplomat uh, in the future, uh, and I have, I think, been inspired by him, and uh, my late father, he passed away, unfortunately. Uh, I think almost uh, half a decade ago, and uh, uh, and immediately after my school years, I applied uh, for uh, uh, attendance to the, uh, to the uh, foreign ministry, and I passed the exams, and I uh, started serving as a foreign uh, officer, and uh, my first post was in Moscow. Uh -huh. Uh, it was interesting during Soviet times, Glasnost and Perestroika, uh, you remember the awakening of uh, the Soviet nation at the time for democracy and uh, other values that we shared. They have still a long way to go, but uh, I think they made the... But those, uh, those, those years of yes. uh, Gorbachev were yes. fascinating it years. It was professionally incredibly uh, interesting, so I learned a lot. And then I was posted from uh, Moscow to Abu Dhabi, which was uh, minus uh, 40 degrees Celsius uh, to, to plus uh, 50 from, degrees from, Celsius. From near constant winter to near constant summer. Absolutely, that was the case. And uh, uh, I spent two, two years there. Afterwards, uh, I was called uh, uh, back to the headquarters and I was assigned as deputy director of the Office of the President, and our president was uh, uh, Tugut at the time, late president, mm -hmm. now uh, he was uh, a great statesman, and I served for him for two years, and then I came to Washington as a first secretary. I served here two tours of duty for four years each, uh, between 1991 1995. 
1997 to 2001. Mm -hmm. And in between, I served as uh, uh, the chief of cabinet uh, to the foreign minister. We had coalition governments then, and uh, I served to three different ministers. Uh, and uh, in 2001, uh, of course, I returned uh, to Turkey again uh, for my uh, uh, for my uh, you know uh, services in uh, in the ministry, and I was uh, uh, placed in. Uh, the Americas Department. Soon after, I was uh, in the Information Department, and uh, later on, I was the spokesperson for the Minister of Foreign Affairs for for a while, uh, for about four years. And uh, then, I was uh, sent and posted to to uh, Israel. As, uh, as ambassador, and I was uh, in Israel. I had wonderful three years in Israel. It was uh, the most interesting post I had uh, at the time. Uh, and uh, later, I was uh, back in Turkey as uh, deputy under secretary uh, for political affairs uh, for a short period of time. And, uh, and one day, uh, they decided to send me to Washington back for the third time. And this is my third uh, tour in the country. I have to take advantage of that experience. But I'm, I'm particularly interested for the, for the moment about your time as ambassador to Israel. Because obviously, um, Israel and Turkey have had a, a relationship that has often been despite what one might think about a representative of the Islamic world and, and the Jewish state, uh, secular state of Israel, but predominantly Jewish state, uh, what was it like being the bridge between the, the two worlds and, and what did you learn in the process? Right. Look, I think this relationship, Turkey and Israel, is a unique one, actually. It is at the same time a historical one. Uh, we have uh, had 520 years of an impeccable uh, relationship with all uh, the Jews uh, mm -hmm. in general. Uh, and uh, it was always appreciated by the Jews because Turkey uh, uh, all along uh, uh, this relationship gave uh, a lot of support and embrace to the Jews. And immediately after the establishment of the uh, of Israel uh, right after uh, United States Turkey recognized Israel as uh, it was the first uh, Muslim majority country, uh, actually the only one uh, which stood up and uh, made its decision to recognize Israel, and since then. 60, as we speak, you know, since we have, uh, since then, until now, we have an uninterrupted uh, relationship. It has its uh, own ups and downs. Of course. Uh, but of course, uh, this relationship is critically important for the stability, peace uh, uh, in the region. And uh, 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 why? Because if you look back you know, historically, you see uh, these two countries. Uh, as uh, the main actors uh, uh, of the region, Turkey and Israel, yes. uh, which is dominated by, uh, actually, uh, geographically by uh, the Arab states. And Turkey, between, uh, of course, uh, these two uh, 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 conflicting parties, let's say, uh, play a mediating role. Uh, always uh, try to build, uh, build the bridges, uh, I think, uh, as much as uh, I think it, it has its own power, uh, helped uh, to create an understanding uh, of, uh, I think, a, a, a cooperation between the two parties. We supported the, uh, the two-state solution uh, from the very beginning, and we still do. Uh, I think uh, the, uh, when 
Okay. Our relationship started. Uh, what makes Tur Turkey different from uh, others is that Turkey is the only Muslim country out of 57 others which has uh, uh, which has uh, uh, first uh, the free market economy, parliamentary democracy, secularism, and uh, also uh, uh, strong connections and uh, uh, direct relations with all Western institutions that you can name of, uh, starting from NATO, OECD, uh, uh, European Council, European Union, all of them. Uh, so Turkey is the only country uh, which brings, uh, uh, I think, democracy, uh, uh, Islam, and modernity together uh, in the most, I think, in, in impressive way. And that gave uh, a power to Turkey, uh, historically, always, yes. in all its relationship. And uh, that reflected itself over our relationship, not only with Israel, but in the entire region. Uh, as we speak today, the Arab Spring is also a product of this. Yes. Well, let me, you anticipated really my, my next question, which is, we've lived through now a, a year and a bit more of the cascading events of the, the Arab Spring in Tunisia and, and in Egypt and Libya and elsewhere throughout the region. What would you say, you just referred to, to Turkey's delicate but very stable balance between free market, democracy, Islam, what are the lessons, what has Turkey learned about that, that balancing act uh, that would be helpful, you think, for other nations just beginning to experiment with, with democracy and the balance between democracy and, and uh, Muslim identity as well? Well, it's an excellent question, and thank you for asking that. I, actually, uh, as I said, first and foremost, I think Turkey uh, has always listened to the will of its own people. I mean, the the uh, the main message here uh, is the people. You cannot do anything against the will of your own people. So uh, today, Turkish people, I think, uh, with all these uh, uh, I think universal values, they asked for a better democracy. Uh, better life standards, better uh, 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 care for uh, its own uh, aspirations. So Turkey geographically sit is sitting in a very uh, critical uh, uh, location at the crossroads of, uh, uh, I think, civilizations, cultures, uh, and, uh, uh, and actually uh, at the crossroads of uh, several uh, I think conflicts yes. at the same time. If you look uh, from uh, you know west to east, uh, you'll see many different uh, issues, and from uh, north to south, the same is true. Uh, we have now uh, the difficulties between the northern countries uh, economically yes. and the south, south, southern countries, and uh, politically we have uh, some. I think very, very uh, important challenges uh, between uh, uh, different, uh, you know, uh, I think nations uh, in our region. If you look at the region, you'll see, you can go clockwise, you can go clockwise. <laughs> it doesn't matter, we're sitting right in the middle of, uh, I think, you are indeed. fire, uh, uh, if you may call it as such. We have uh, enormous issues. We have uh, like the entire North Africa, we have uh, the Middle East, we have uh, Syria, I I Iraq, Iran, uh, Caucasus, the Balkans, uh, we have uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, we have uh, the entire uh, North Africa. Uh, so we have some thematic issues like <coughs> uh, fight against terrorism, uh, extremism, uh, we have uh, uh, energy issues, energy security. Yes. Uh, we have uh, many others which are uh, sitting right uh, in 
the middle of uh, the international uh, agenda of uh, the U.S. I mean, it's almost identical, overlaps. So uh, we have to deal with those uh, problems. Uh, but Turkey, uh, in the middle of this fire, sitting as an island of stability. What makes Turkey so powerful is uh, two things. First, uh, the economic stability and political stability. We have both, uh, thanks God. Uh, and uh, the sustainability of this is a challenge to us. But I believe uh, uh, we have, uh, I mean, given our performance so far, uh, we are looking uh, at the future with uh, a great confidence. Well, you refer to Turkey's economic growth, and it's been remarkable. I, mean, I think many people don't realize Turkey's rates of economic growth have actually exceeded China's, about which we talk so much. What, uh, what are the, the pros and cons of that, that economic growth? It has happened so fast, uh, but uh, obviously has created great changes within the country. At the same time, it also brings difficulties of its own, inflation, for example, and large amounts of, of foreign direct investment that may or may not come with some strings attached as well. But in the last uh, 10 years, I, I, I could say, I think, as you said, our economic uh, development is remarkable. We have tripled our uh, GDP. Can you imagine? Uh, uh, and we have tripled uh, the, the per capita income of our people. Uh, we have uh, almost, uh, I think, uh, expanded the, uh, the overall economy uh, in, in the most impressive way. Uh, and uh, how could we just deliver? Uh, first thing is that the commitment of the people, the commitment uh, of uh, uh, the government uh, to, to what the values we, that we all share, like uh, uh, tax, trust, uh, accountability, transparency, rule of law, uh, professionalism, and so on and so forth. And those values uh, really, I think, flourished uh, in the last uh, decade. Uh, if you look at the, uh, uh, the accession process of Turkey uh, with the EU, yes. that also uh, gave a lot of, uh, I think, dynamism in the country. We have benefited from, uh, from those, uh, uh, I think, steps and improvements. Uh, which came uh, through our accession process, the EU. Although uh, we uh, were not, I think, responded in, in the way that it should be, uh, I think, uh, which was not the case to other uh, candidate countries, uh, if, if, we, if we come and discuss this EU process. Yes. Uh, we have uh, some, we feel like we are a little bit discriminated, which is, uh, which shouldn't be the case uh, if you look at the values that the institute, uh, that civilization project, yes. which is the EU, uh, it is alien to that. However, we will never shy away from those values. The commitment is still there. We'll eventually, we, we are, uh, I think, determined to, to, to make it up to for the full membership. And uh, why we think it's such? Because uh, I personally uh, believe uh, that EU can never be a global uh, counterbalance uh, power mm -hmm. if it does, it does not put a, a, a religious and cultural diversity into this project. Uh, and that's uh, the, the, the only country that could offer such a diversity is Turkey. Turkey is the only country among uh, others, with all uh, full respect, uh, of course, to others, uh, but who can give that diversity uh, to the European nation as a European country. Yes. Turkey uh, is uh, a part of Europe. Uh, Turkey and Turkish people are uh, committed to those values uh, that, that we all share. Uh, and although they are 
demonstrated, I think, by uh, the uh, EU, I think, treatment, uh, as opposed to what we have uh, achieved today, I think it was not appreciated in the way that we uh, it should be. Yes. So, but this not just uh, uh, in any way uh, diminish our uh, commitment uh, to EU. So, Turkey, uh, by uh, these, uh, I think, historical background, uh, Turkey is the sixth largest uh, economic power uh, uh, in, in, in Europe, 16th in a global sense. Yes. And last year, uh, we have achieved, uh, uh, again, it's, it's a remarkable growth rate, uh, somewhere around 9 point something percent. Uh, I, uh, and this year, 8.5 percent. Uh, the two, uh, I think, figures are next after China, yes. uh, globally. And the most uh, uh, impressive, uh, I think, uh, economic performance. So we will continue this. Uh, we will do it for, for our own people. Because they want us uh, to deliver. They want and they deserve a better life. Let me ask you, you, you talked very, very directly to the question of Turkey's accession, its candidate status to the, the European Union now. And, that's, and, and Turkey has had a particularly close relationship both in trade and uh, in industrial development with, with Germany. I, mean, I remember, we both remember, uh, a time when uh, the guest Arbeiter in, uh, in Germany when there were large numbers of Turkey, Turkish workers. We also remember when many of those Turkish workers were encouraged, uh, and I use the word encouraged euphemistically, but to encourage to leave. I mean, there has been a very, I guess, emotional dimension to the relationship between Europe and, and Turkey. To be sure, <coughs> Turkey has a foothold, literally a foothold, uh, in Europe. Uh, but it's also been the case that there, there's a sort of undercurrent of, of uncertainty about each other there, I think. How, how could that be overcome? But it's, uh, again, uh, a very nice question. What is the power and why uh, is the United States a more economic force? Or the only more economic force? There is a reason for that. That is because of its diversity. Diversity, uh, this embracing attitude uh, of uh, the system here uh, makes this country uh, powerful. Yes. Uh, and the second thing is uh, the, the big thinking. The people are taught to think big here mm -hmm. in this country. Uh, again, you know, I should be diplomatic. Easily say the same thing for Europe. Uh, because it, taking Turkey into the ranks of Europe uh, and embrace Turkey into uh, uh, the EU uh, takes big thinking. Uh, I think, uh, in that sense, uh, we can easily see this uh, as, as a sort of test case in our relationship with uh, Germany. Germany, there are uh, about 4 million Turks. We wanted them to get integrated into the country, to be a part of the society, uh, and to uh, put their added value to, uh, uh, to the German society, and be uh, an integral part of that society, and be a building bridge between uh, Turkey and Germany. And due to some, uh, I think, failures on both sides, I wouldn't just say uh, or put the blame on one side or another, uh, but I think that integration uh, and, and that uh, diversity uh, could not be created. But uh, things are turning around uh, lately. Uh, it's not uh, the case uh, anymore. I think. Uh, now, uh, the Turkish uh, uh, Germans, let's say, <laughs> like Turkish Americans, <laughs> uh, 
uh, are uh, you know be becoming uh, mostly uh, in many walks of life, I think, uh, more integrated to the society, and they have uh, uh, started to become, uh, uh, I mean, represented in different, uh, you know, yes. uh, 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 you know political uh, organizations and parties, and more active in daily life. Uh, I think this will help uh, uh, not only to Turkey uh, or Germany, but this relationship. And in the final analysis, I think we will see uh, a, a creation of uh, a, a bigger cage for both of us to take our own share. Because this could be, uh, I think, the, 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 the same analysis could be made uh, by, uh, I mean, by anyone uh, uh, when you look at our uh, relationship with the EU. Yes. I mean, they think that we want to go into the EU and take our share from the existing cave, which is not the, ca uh, the case. We want to go into the EU, make the cave bigger, and then take our share. This is what it takes when you, uh, I think, uh, because when we hear some arguments about the size of Turkey, the uh, population of Turkey, uh, the uh, religious identity of Turkey, all of those arguments are void, I mean, if you look at this. Because when we started this accession process, uh, we were Muslims, you know, we were no different. We were, again, a big uh, uh, country. Yes. We were, uh, our population was uh, quite significant then. So, and those arguments are not uh, quite valid today. So, my main message is, I think, the diversity. Diversity uh, and the, the, the values that, again, establishes uh, or establish the, the foundations of uh, EU, uh, the compromise. Consensus, uh, embracement, yes. and these are all uh, inclusiveness. Uh, these should be consolidated. Yeah. Uh, at, at the same time that the accession to the EU has been a, a, a continuing issue over a decade or so now, um, Turkey's membership in NATO has been integral to its identity, and Turkey has been a very active player, often referred to as the eastern anchor of of NATO. What, two things. One, why do you think that relationship in the NATO alliance has been so different than perhaps the history of seeking membership in the EU? Um, and second, how has the NATO alliance changed from Turkey's point of view with the collapse of the Soviet Union during, during that time that you were there, in fact? Well, this is, a, 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 again, you know, this is a very interesting process. I think uh, uh, NATO uh, has changed uh, its nature, uh, uh, as, as you said, after the collapse of the, the Soviet Union. Uh, it was a, a sort of a, a, a defensive uh, military alliance, but now uh, it has become a, 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 an organization which promotes the values of democracy, uh, uh, that we all uh, share today, or we all, or, or some of uh, our, uh, I think, uh, friendly countries is, is fire. That's what the nature, uh, the, the change in the nature of NATO. And uh, Turkey, of course, made its own contribution as being the sole uh, Muslim member of NATO. The only Muslim member of NATO through Turkey that uh, NATO uh, has the legit legitimacy that it needs when it operates in some uh, uh, countries like Afghanistan. Yes. Just imagine the absence of Turkish troops there, uh, I mean, which is uh, contributing significantly to uh, the ISAF, the International Security and Assistance Force uh, in Afghanistan. 
uh, uh, it is a NATO force, as you uh, yes. remember. So Turkey has been asked to command ISAF four times. Yes, I know. Eh? And now we are, uh, again, at the same time, we are uh, uh, commanding the Kabul security forces. Uh, why is Turkey uh, asked to do so? Because Turkey, uh, as I said, with its unique uh, uh, place among the Muslim majority countries, uh, uh, it, it, it's, uh, I think, uh, its significance is those values which uh, it holds uh, dear. Yes. Uh, so which actually the same values uh, uh, which institutes NATO I mean, today, <coughs> the relevance of NATO. <coughs> I think uh, NATO, uh, what NATO did in Libya, again, these are uh, all for the values that we all cherish in order to take uh, those values, uh, uh, I think, rooted in, in those societies in Libya, uh, we had to deal with uh, the forces who were resisting. So I think uh, in the absence of Turkey, uh, then it would be perceived, perceived in a different way. In a very different way. Um, uh, I don't want to go into details of this whole thing, but I think uh, if uh, you have this, uh, any operation that you can think of, NATO, uh, then it would be perceived as a sort of uh, uh, a, a bias type of uh, operation, which uh, one side of this whole uh, balance uh, represented. So by the presence of Turkey, it all changes, of course. So this is our critical role in, in NATO. And I think uh, it will continue to be as such in the future. Yes. And we will, uh, because we will, uh, we have the commitment uh, to try to uh, defend the values that uh, establish uh, NATO. Let me, you referred to the, this past year's experience with Libya and NATO's role there and particularly Turkey's role there. As we look around the region and we look at the, the aftermath of the Arab Spring, which has been quite different in different countries, are there, are there any lessons from the experience in Libya that can be drawn on and perhaps applied more widely or elsewhere in the region? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, you're right. I think there are less lessons. Uh, the lessons are, of course, those countries are uh, going through a, a, a very, very difficult transformation. Transformation to democracy. So uh, it should come from the people uh, themselves. Yes. It, it cannot be just imposed from outside, which was the case, actually, if you look at the uh, historical background when it just popped up in Tunisia uh, by a person uh, who burned himself yes. uh, uh, and started this whole process. Uh, actually, this was out of, uh, I think, a, a sort of a, 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 a little, I think, a very symbolic uh, type of uh, uh, action created uh, the dynamism for the people to stand against uh, the tyrant. Uh, so today, the ownership of this process in different countries, of course, in each country, uh, in, in each country's case is different. Uh, we cannot just compare each and every country uh, or find, a, a, I think, a, a one uh, single uh, template for all uh, countries, it is different. It, it, each country's case is different. However, uh, what, is, uh, what is important is that this should be owned by the people and it should be done peacefully. That is important. And uh, 
Thirdly, I think it should stand on legitimate grounds. Legitimacy is of utmost importance. Uh, everything should be uh, has a, a, a legitimate ground, which we we feel the difficulties now in in, uh, in the case uh, of Syria. Now we have uh, we don't have any international legitimacy uh, because we cannot get anything out of this uh, UN Security Council uh, so far, uh, and although we try to create a uh, a legitimate ground for that, but uh, I think ultimately we should have uh, the UN Security Council uh, decision. And domestically, again, this ownership is needed, which creates a domestic uh, legitimacy uh, the opposition. And you cannot do, uh, or you cannot just act uh, on behalf of uh, the people of any single country. I mean, they should create their own uh, I think process. Uh, so that's why the opposition here, although it's a legitimate interlocutor, uh, which was uh, declared as such, but it's not, uh, we couldn't put still the D uh, in, in front of it. It's still A. So we, uh, these are the reasons. You know, it should be owned by the people, it should be done peacefully, and it should have a legitimate. Mr. Ambassador, I'm afraid there our, our time together is running out. I wish I could keep you the entire morning. It's a fascinating conversation. But you've been very articulate about your country's accomplishments over the last decade and, and truthfully over its, its, its modern history. I wonder if you might share with us two things uh, as we conclude. One, what is your greatest fear for your country? And two, what is your greatest dream for your country's future? Well, thank you for asking that. My, uh, my dream is the dream of my people, actually. The dream of pe my people is that uh, we have the, uh, very soon, we will have uh, the 100th anniversary of our republic. Yes. Uh, that, if that dream comes true, Turkey wants to be uh, you know, one out of ten biggest uh, economies of the world. That's our aspiration. Today we are the 16th. We want to be among the, the top ten. That's our dream. And of course, uh, that requires uh, that we have uh, about half a trillion uh, dollar, uh, of course, uh, exports. We have to have. Uh, trillion uh, dollar uh, economy. We have to have, uh, of course, per capita income about $30,000 for uh, our people. These are our, uh, uh, I mean, the dream of our uh, own people. So this is, this is my dream, uh, uh, you know, accordingly. Uh, my fear is that in a, I mean, in a volatile region, sustainability of this stability uh, that we have created, both yes. on the economic front and in the political front, which is the greatest challenge, and it brings some, some fears in it. Uh, uh, I, I mean, you cannot avoid this. When you, uh, uh, if you look around in Turkey, when all those fires are burning in different places, you cannot just rest uh, and sit in your own home comfortably, as you could imagine. Yes. So, uh, that, that, that scares us. Uh, that's why we are so active in, in diplomatically. Uh, uh, people are asking why Turkey is, is enormously active diplomatically. That's the reason. The only aim, uh, the only objective is to put off those fires one by one. That's what we are engaged uh, uh, in all our power with all those problems. We cannot say indifferent. When uh, you look at the uh, political you know, difficulties around Turkey, uh, uh, I mean, it has an impact. 
I mean, it's, it's uh, uh, over Turkey. Uh, whatever happens in Syria, uh, affects us, especially in Iraq, same. In Iran, same. Caucasus, the same. All our adjacent uh, regions in the Middle East, the same. And we have cultural uh, uh, and historical affinity to our wider region in the Middle East, in North Africa, in Central Asia. Turkey is right in the middle. And uh, I think Turkey is an inspirational role model for all those countries. Uh, because most of them are Muslim majority countries. They say, they look at Turkey. I'll give you one example. When we were uh, given a negotiation date uh, by EU in 2004, I never forget. Uh, it was 17 December uh, 2004. There were 274 uh, journals from all over Islamic uh, countries yes. uh, 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 physically present in, in, in uh, Brussels. Why were they there? Because they were just looking at Turkey, the example of Turkey. I mean, uh, they could have just, uh, uh, I think, covered all those news uh, through news wires or, you know, other uh, sources, but they were there to witness uh, uh, what Turkey has been doing. Because they say to their own people, if Turkey can do it, we can do it. So we are proud to give such an inspiration, inspiration to, to our uh, friends uh, in, in, in our neighborhood. And uh, Turkey will never lose its commitment all those universal values that we share. Thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador, for your, your candor and your insights and your experience and, and sharing your dreams Thank and you. your fears uh, in the region because it gives a very clear-eyed view of, of the special place that Turkey holds in its diplomatic role, its economic role, and in its historical role. Thank in you, the Jim. region. Thank you. I really enjoyed this conversation. I did too. We'll have to do it again soon. I Absolutely. Hope. Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you for joining us at Diplomatic Connections as we continue our series of interviews with ambassadors here in Washington and our discussions with opinion leaders who shape the diplomatic connections that we have with each other. I hope you'll join us again soon and view one of the other interviews that we have on our website. Thank you so much and good day.